Getting the conversation going while you're settling and uh, grabbing some pizza, I will, I'll begin the introductions. Uh, my, my name's Professor Michaela Keaton. I'm the chair of the guest speakers committee uh, for, uh, for the season and, and for this, our final event uh, in, in the lecture series this year. Uh, I'd like to say a couple of um, introductory comments. I'll, I'll introduce the guests. I'll turn it over to them. And I'm going to ask that you continue to gather your pizza and enjoy it um, uh, over, the course of the, uh, over the course of the hour. First, as we gather here today, we acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. And uh, we pay our respects to uh, our First Nation and, and Métis um, colleagues, ancestors of this place, and uh, reaffirm our relationship uh, with one another. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the McCurcher uh, Law Firm for sponsoring the series and, uh, and in that way encouraging um, and supporting the wide range of speakers that we've had this year, educational, entertaining, informative. And in that vein, today's topic I think is a, is, um, a very important one to end our series on. It's important, it's challenging. And we'll have the chance today to hear from uh, people who are, who are experimenting with innovative approaches um, on the ground in the courts, um, uh, as well as thinking and talking about it. So it's a wonderful opportunity for that. Our guest speakers today uh, are the Honorable um, Anne Dugas Horsman, uh, who is uh, recently retired from the provincial court uh, in New Brunswick and Dr. Linda Nielsen, who is uh, recently retired from the faculty at the University of New Brunswick as well. A uh, couple of things ab about them. Their, their CVs are long and accomplished, um, but I think for the purpose of today, what you might be interested in knowing is, are, are these things. Um, so uh, Judge Duga Horseman was appointed to the provincial court uh, sitting in Moncton 16 years ago. And of that stretch of time, she spent 10 years presiding in, in the domestic violence specialized court in Moncton, uh, and, which is a very long and dedicated service uh, in, in that court. Uh, and many courts across Canada have experimented or are experimenting with, with specialized courts to deal with domestic and family violence. Um, uh, but um, that's a very long and, and deep commitment um, to, to that kind of a forum. In 2015, she was awarded a national award by the Canadian Association of Provincial Court Judges for her dedication and her innovation in, in that area. Dr. Nielsen is um, internationally recognized for her work in the domestic violence field. She's very well known for her publications and I would say this is one of the things that's distinguished her, her, um, her academic life is her practical tools and guidance for people who are working on the ground. Uh, to deal with the uh, challenges, challenging issues around family violence. Judges, lawyers, mediators, and other, pro other professionals who are working in this field. And, um, and m quite recently um, has uh, produced uh, an incredible piece of work, um, bench book for judges who, who are dealing with domestic violence issues in their courtrooms. And uh, it's really to be admired. The two of them have worked together uh, <clears throat> quite extensively in the do domestic violence initiatives in the provincial court in New Brunswick. And so they'll be talking to you about what they've learned uh, in, uh, in their work, uh, connecting ideas with practice and talking about the challenges and the opportunities operationally. And I think that's quite exciting. Um, so I'll welcome both of them uh, up and I ask you to join me in, in welcoming them here today. So what we would like to do today, first of all, we're, 
we want to thank you, Michaela, for your kind words. And uh, we're here today hoping to share a few thoughts on the complexity of the legal system reform in domestic violence cases and the work that we have done together because uh, throughout this 10 year, Linda has been uh, the academic advisor for the court, constantly steering us in the right direction in terms of what the research has shown to be beneficial in this field. And uh, we want to discuss with you our approach to building a new cross-courts coordinated model uh, spanning the provincial court and the family court of, uh, division of the Court of Queen's Bench in, uh, in, in the field of domestic violence. Now, one of the things that we know for, uh, now from decades of domestic violence research, um, that research generates the same problems and documents the same problems over and over and over again. And um, so what we find is that statutory reform and, and other kinds of educational initiatives aren't solving the problems that are uh, appearing in domestic violence cases. So what we want to talk to you a bit about today is the reasons for that and the things that we really need to focus on if we're going to produce effective change for Canadian families in uh, the legal system and particularly across legal systems. We've, we've had our introduction, so we will uh, skip these two, uh, two slides. Um, I do want to say um, um, about uh, Judge Horseman, she's an extremely knowledgeable and competent judge, and sh it has been absolutely uh, my pleasure. She's a wonderful, wonderful person to work with. She's a wonderful human being, so I did want to say that. <laughs> All right, so um, Linda wrote the script, you see, <laughs> so <laughs> I have to follow. Um, we think it's important in this work to stress values, and on the slides you see some of the values that we believe in. So gender equality is a given, um, and women and children have a fundamental human right to live life free from domestic violence. And in our view, Canada has not only a moral duty, but also a legal duty to uh, take action to make the systems work. So the, the first question to ask ourselves is why to focus on legal system and what in the final analysis, analysis does it mean? One of the... Um, um, things that is really important here, I think, is that we look beyond legal rules and statutes and actually look at how institutional systems work. So when I think about law and the legal system, what I think about is um, uh, structure. I think about the components of the systems. I think about relationships among those components. The legal system, in, in, in essence, is a, a social t system. I wear both hats. I, I wear a hat as a sociologist and also as a legal academic. The system has identifiable um, structure. It has identifiable boundaries. We can identify roles and norms within that system. It has identifiable norms and ideology. So. When I think about law and the legal system, I don't just think about rules. I think about those relationships and those connections, and I think about how those connections affect what actually happens at the end of the day in, legal, in um, domestic violence cases. So if we take that idea and we shift it into a theoretical perspective, First, uh, sociological perspective, and this comes from uh, Anthony Giddens, his work, The Constitution of Society. 
And in essence, what he's telling us is that human action uh, not only shapes our social institutions, but our social institutions shape human action within those systems. So if we think about this in terms of the legal system, it means that every player in that system is uh, constrained in many respects uh, by the resources and by the structure of the uh, institution that they work in. Similarly, we switch hats and we look at this from a domestic violence research perspective. This is a quote from one of my favorite domestic uh, violence researchers. She's from the uh, United States. And here's what she says about reform in the child protection system. And she says, even if every child protection worker in the state were completely knowledgeable about the power dynamics that categorize battering relationships, and even if every worker were fully aware and sensitive to the social conditions that battered women face, there would be limited change in how these cases are currently handled. The problem lies less in the knowledge that people have, individual people have, than in how workers within the systems are institutionally required, directed, resourced to think about these cases. Similarly, if we look at this from a jurisprudence legal theory perspective, we see the same kind of conclusions. If we truly wish to understand the operation of law, we need to look beyond legal rules, statutes and cases, and look at what is actually happening in these cases. You'll recognize that uh, these, um, these authors are uh, legal realists, I don't necessarily endorse everything that the legal realists tell us. But one of the really important key principles here, um, identified particularly by Jerome Frank, is the importance of facts. And so we're going to talk about uh, and focus very strongly on facts and institutional structures. So if we take those theoretical ideas and we move to an empirical perspective and we begin to look at the empirical research on legal system performance in domestic violence cases, what we see is, and similarly to the uh, theorists that I've identified, is that if we look at legal rules, for example, we look at statutes, we look at the charter, and then we begin to look at what the courts of appeal do. And then we look beyond that and we look at what the trial courts do. And we are beyond that and we look at what happens when we look at court files and interview, interview uh, people who have been involved in the courts. We begin to see that our picture of what is happening in these cases in terms of patterns begins to change uh, dramatically, and we documented this in an earlier report called Spousal Abuse, Children and the Legal System. It's 2001, but if you want to have a look at it, it is online. So the conclusion that we make in that work and, and, um, and consistent with the theorists that we've discussed is our problems are less about faulty legal rules than about what facts get considered when legal rules are applied. Basically, there are two reasons for this. We have technical rules of evidence. Those are very important tech, uh, uh, rules, and it's important that we know them, and they have uh, very important reasons for their existence. But those technical rules of evidence filter what facts get through to decision makers and to courts. At the same time, we have a procedural a filtering processes. 
negotiation processes, settlement processes that, again, filter what facts uh, a court actually gets to hear at the end of this process. So against this background, you can well understand that uh, it becomes essential that we need to start with a detailed understanding of why legal systems operate as they do. And Linda will deal with the social science aspect of this because it, it is a specialty. We have decades of social science um, evidence uh, that tells us that we cannot fix this problem merely by statutory uh, law change. We really need to look at our institutional structures and the flow of information and facts behind that. Now, as we think about this, we start with a disciplinary challenge. Social scientists, and on the one hand, and judges and lawyers, on the other hand, don't speak the same language. This isn't the result of lack of knowledge. It isn't the result of lack of, uh, of understanding. It's a result of different disciplines working in very, very different institutional frameworks. Social science knowledge has no direct application in the legal system. It's very important that it inform the legal system, but it has no direct application. And this is because social scientists study trends. They study patterns of behavior. So they document what is usual. But that's insufficient for in a legal context because the legal system has to respond to the individual circumstances of each case, even cases that are highly unusual and don't fit with social science trends. But you dealt with that. Okay, so sorry. I'll, I'll let sorry, you I'll, <laughs> sorry, I got carried away here. <laughs> My, um, so we can teach judges and lawyers and mediators all about the differences between minor isolated violence, um, re victim resistance violence, co patterns of coercion and control. But as Linda said, when it comes to the issue of facts, these concepts have really very little meaning without a comprehensive uh, admission and consideration of the facts that support them. So when you come to the technical legal rules of evidence, the filters can be identified as such. And so this is just, uh, just a list of some of the uh, evidence filters that we need to think about. And how, so one of the challenges here is how do you get credible, valid information through these evidence filters? We also have, and as I mentioned before, procedural filters that are operating here. This was documented. Uh, we looked at this filtering process in that earlier analysis of spousal abuse cases, children in the legal system. At each stage here, from the time the client communicates facts to the lawyer, the conversion of those facts into legal categories, documentation of those facts in court files through the negotiation and plea bargaining process. At each stage of that process, information about the patterns and details of domestic violence gets lost. And so we know empirically that what is getting through to, to uh, courts in these cases tends to be a tiny, tiny piece of of the full puzzle here. What do you see? Anybody? What? Old lady? Anybody see anything else? Young lady? Young lady? Okay. Um, this, our conclusions are very much uh, based on the information we receive. And that, in turn, affects the images. And so, this is true of courts and judges, too. If the facts 
aren't fully detailed and fully uh, presented, what looks like a minor isolated domestic violence case, because of the images presented, may in fact be a very complex, um, serious domestic violence case. So if we think about this from a legal uh, system uh, perspective, this is a uh, quotation from Mark <coughs> Planter, a uh, legal academic, and he talks about how, in fact, the legal system is overloaded. And the system cannot actually, at the moment, deal, give each case the detailed analysis that uh, is really warranted in these cases. So what we end up with, again, is a filtering process. This is another quotation from Mark Galanter. And what he concludes is, the legal system has capacity to change a great deal at the level of rules, statutes, without corresponding changes in actual patterns of practice. And when we look at the domestic violence research, my own in Canada, also similar uh, conclusions are being reached in uh, Australian uh, legal system research. What we find is simply changing our statutes and saying, for example, uh, judges must consider uh, domestic violence when making a uh, custody and access decision. That'll certainly change the discourse of the decisions, but not necessarily the patterns of practice because of the issue of facts. So, as a result of that, those of us working in the field know that the legal system is changing in fundamental ways. And we're moving from a model where assessing facts and evidence and applying the legal rules to this factual scenario is actually giving way to a model focused on, uh, focused on settlement and resolution of conflict. So the legal system itself, and you can see this through the access of, uh, uh, to justice literature, the legal system itself is beginning to move from a system in which you have technical uh, admission of facts, application of evidence rules, uh, and, and then application of legal resolution, to a system which is very much based on settlement, uh, achieving um, consensus, uh, and so on. This filtering process is far more pronounced than it was when I did the uh, earlier research in uh, early 2000. We, and I think we really need to think really carefully about how this shift in the system itself is going to affect access and interpretation um, of facts, and particularly in domestic violence cases. Uh, this is an article that I wrote um, back when I was working with the uh, National Judicial Institute uh, judges on, on uh, bench books. One of the things I was horrified to discover is that uh, across the country in, in, in a number of jurisdictions, we have judges sitting down with uh, parties in these cases with no prior documentation, no screening, no uh, assessment of domestic violence and attempting to um, reach agreement. So this article is, a, is my attempt to talk about some of the uh, dangers of doing that and to suggest some procedural uh, uh, options that could actually help to make that kind of process uh, safer. So, in short, for those of us that are working to protect, towards protecting women and children in these type of cases, it is clear that everything is about facts and the systems insofar as, they are con insofar as the institutional processes and structures are concerned. We also know that uh, until we attend to those filters that affect what facts go through, whether they be procedural or evidentiary, uh, we're going to meet with a major problem.
Now, there's been a number of uh, works. Well, there's at least three of here that Linda has been extremely involved with, in fact, has been the author of. Uh, the first one is uh, Enhancing Safety, and that one is available on the Department of Justice Canada website. Uh, for anybody that's interested in the field, I really, really uh, recommend it. The second one is the Judicial Handbook that you've heard referred to in Michaela's presentation. It was until now only available to the members of NJI, which by and large are judges, judges, pardon me, but uh, it's a mammoth amount of, I mean, it's a magnum opus, and uh, it, it, it is, will soon be available through Can Lee, and I'll let Linda talk, present her or next baby. I, I, uh, what I've done, um, the, I wrote three editions of that work, and I've updated it now and reorganized it uh, to make it available to uh, lawyers and service providers. Because in, in, in um, uh, it really depends on the lawyers and service providers to get the information through to the court. So that work is uh, going to come out on Canly. It's uh, as in a new uh, ebook format. Um, probably in a, in a few months, uh, we hope. But even after we attend to domestic violence education, even after we attend to the statutes, even after we attend to the technical filters, still isn't going to fix the problem. So we know we need a response to the in institutional structures we need. I, we, we work in, and I hope Linda has managed to convince you of that. And I'll let her introduce the next slide because uh, I think it, it, it's a picture that's worth a thousand words. Okay, so the next series of slides that I'm going to present were originally uh, created from, uh, by Praxis International, which is a research, uh, domestic violence research institute in the States. Don't worry about the details. This is a, a conceptual piece. So first comes the 911 call, meetings with uh, Crown, meetings with victim services, um, uh, attendance at uh, bail hearings, and so on. Meanwhile, police have involved uh, child protection uh, because children are involved more meetings with uh, social workers, child protection mediators, um, and um, here she's told that uh, domestic violence is very harmful to children. If he returns to the home, uh, the children may have to be removed. Um, um, so they advised her, oh, you, what you need to do now is you need to apply for a civil protection order. You need to apply to, and meanwhile, you need to apply to a family court um, uh, for custody and seek supervised uh, access. Meanwhile, she's grappling with uh, no safe housing. Uh, he probably has the car. Probably at this point, no support is being paid. She doesn't have an order for support yet. Um, no safe housing near the children's schools. The children are upset about being removed from their communities. So she applies for her uh, civil uh, protection order. Here she's told that uh, these orders tend to be uh, very short term. Um, he's um, not uh, going to be bound by the order until he's served. Uh, how does she prove that the children need protection if the domestic violence was only between the adults? Roadblock number one, how does she get protection for the children? Um, but in most jurisdictions, these orders are uh, ex parte, which means they have to be, removed, re be reviewed by a superior court judge. Uh, many of them uh, don't survive that review. When these orders are granted, uh, we have problems across our systems in terms of enforcement of breaches. So she goes through um, a, a series of, of instances where he breaches the order, not much is done. She gives up on that process, turns to the family court, 
goes to her uh, family court lawyer, yet more ne meetings with parenting uh, assessors, uh, a whole new set of uh, professionals. Here she's told that in many jurisdictions, um, courts take a very dim view of a parent seeking to restrict the other parent's access. If she continues with those claims, she might be accused of parent alienation. She might have uh, difficulty uh, retaining the children. So no funds yet to hire a domestic violence expert, no funds to uh, proceed. So we have a high settlement here. In essence, this is the system that we're offering people when they attempt to uh, leave um, domestic violence relationships. And I would say that the system is actually uh, more complex and worse than this slide indicates because we've got our court systems operating often at co cross purposes. Well, does it look better from the inside? Um, I'd say uh, with some great difficulty, not really, because uh, as a criminal court judge, you may know that there is a, an order in family court, but you're not certain that it is there unless there are protocols in place, and very often there is not. If on the, on the converse side, you're a family court judge, uh, somebody will have told you, one of the parties, will have told you that uh, the, the, the other party has been charged for an offense of violence. You may, you may know what the offense is, and I'm not even sure that you know particularly what it is. You certainly do not have in your file the information, if in fact he has been charged, you do not have in your file the information that the criminal court judge has, which usually has pictures and, and a number of things. You may know that there's been a bail hearing and he's been released. You usually do, you may not, at least I'm speaking here of course for New Brunswick. As a rule, unless the party has a very vigilant legal, legal aid lawyer who took the trouble to go to provincial court and obtain the release paper if in fact he was released on bail. So these are all the challenge that come with from from, the, from inside the system with regards to information. So wherever we look at the um, legal system, domestic violence research, whether we're looking at the research in Canada, or we're looking at Australia, New Zealand, or we're looking at the United States, we're seeing the same problems. We've got a really serious problem with information flow, both at the across services and information flow among court systems. This isn't obvious. Um, these cases fail when any of our links are out of line, whether it's connections within each system or at the uh, intersection of our legal systems. So everybody's ultimate aim is to take the best decision po possible for the parties and the children of the parties in front of the court. So where do we, how do we get from this maze that you saw earlier to a coordinated approach. And uh, one place to start, I think, is to look at the cross-sector definition problems. Our legal systems don't even speak the same language in domestic violence cases. Criminal code, you all know it's a, a it's a prohibited incident-driven uh, regime that prohibits certain acts of violence, and this is what we're dealing with in provincial court. Yet, if we look at um, the uh, intimate partner violence or domestic violence research, what we know is that if we're going to understand what's happening in these cases, it's all about pattern. It's not about incidents. So I'm going to um, uh, give you an il illustration of, of what I'm talking about here, about the difference between incidents and patterns. This comes from uh, earlier um, interviews with, with abused women. 
I had my bags packed. I went and got supper. Then he started on me. He was so drunk. He said he was going to call the police. I was scared of the police because he convinced me over the years to think everything was my fault. I told him he was not calling the police. I, he dialed again. I picked up the phone. I bashed him over the head. She drew blood. She knocked him out. He needed stitches. She reported on this occasion she was not at all frightened of him. Um, he was so drunk he could hardly stand, couldn't defend himself. Yet, we look at the same case and we uh, look at the uh, history and pattern. He hit me once before marriage. I thought it was my fault. I apologized. As the years went on, he beat me up uh, really bad about every six months. The night I left, which is when this incident occurred, uh, he'd been beating me up about once uh, a week for a couple years. Just good at it. He never hit me in the face until the last few months, and then I got the black eyes. He locked me out of the television room three years before I left. I was only allowed in if I was not arguing with him, if I cooked supper the way he wanted, if I'd not talked back to him. I was not allowed to eat when he ate. The context of that phone violence is imminent separation. She had her bags packed, she was leaving. If we assess that one incident using a uh, primary aggressor rather than a dominant aggressor analysis, she instigated the violence, she exercised the most power, Clearly, she was the primary aggressor in the exchange. If we focus instead on the pattern of the relationship, it was clear that the, her husband was in control of the onset of violence and the pattern of violence in the relationship. So, this is one of the reasons why it is so critically important to get facts and complete detailed facts through those filters that we were talking about. Because it's only through detailed understanding and analysis that we can separate minor isolated violence that is relatively common in relationships from victim resistance violence, like the example that I just gave you, from coercion control pattern violence. And it's important because it's coercion control pattern violence that is associated with child abuse, that is associated with documented uh, parenting patterns that replicate that coercion and control pattern, and that is associated with the vulnerable child. Our failure to distinguish patterns of domestic violence across systems is causing havoc. We're overreacting to minor isolated acts of violence, for example, at separation. We're over-criminalizing victim resistance violence, and we're un continue to underreact to coercion and control violence. Again, there's only one way to distinguish, and that is you need detailed information and facts in order to make uh, a valid uh, conclusion. Every single time we get this wrong, we are potentially uh, constructing a child developmental failure. One of the things that is uh, really important here is to understand the uh, connections between domestic violence and child harm. Please, please, please go visit the National Scientific uh, Council on the Developing Child at Harvard University. Read the working papers there on toxic stress and on persistent fear and how those um, affect child development. So, 
obviously we have structural problem and this they focus a lot on major information exchange challenges across all legal system because we know and we see it at least from where I sit that uh, very little information is being automatically shared and exchanged and uh, there's a number of reasons for that. Some are built into the statute, some are structural into the ver because of the very structure of the, whether the agencies and the protocols they have to work with or simply by the structure of the tribunal. In Moncton per se, we've tried to address that because Moncton is, uh, the, the legal system in New Brunswick lends itself to that because we have a unified family court which means there's only one portal of entry for anybody that enters into the, the family court system and there's the same on the criminal side. We don't have justices of the peace, we have only the provincial court so there as well there's only one portal of entry. So what happens to our, our woman as she moves from the criminal uh, system to um, the uh, family case. First of all, her behavior uh, at the time at separation um, of violence is not going to classify as self-defense. So potentially we've now got a victim with a criminal conviction for domestic violence. Now as you know, um, she probably can't, re she cannot rebut responsibility for that specific criminal act. But what the criminal courts have not decided, and because of the limitations of the criminal code, has not decide, made any decision about the actual pattern and type of domestic violence here. So uh, the evidence of uh, pattern can still be admitted here. If her lawyer understands connections between intimate partner violence and uh, understands the types. If her lawyer knows where to look for evidence. If her lawyer understands the connection between domestic violence and child harm. If her lawyer understands both the criminal and family systems. If her lawyer doesn't advise her to settle, which is probably the most likely. If her lawyer knows how to obtain, uh, use and interpret evidence from one system in another system and if the judge takes into account the differences between the systems. There's a lot of ifs. Victim recant. You can't talk about domestic violence without talking about victim recant because it is unfortunately the bane of prosecutors in prosecuting this type of offenses. And you can put in place a lot of protocols, the best protocol that the research tells you will help alleviate a victim recant. You never quite know whether the circumstances of a complainant in a case of a, of a domestic violence and you never quite know what influences she has to live with or exactly what uh, leads her to recant. So. So we've got an emerging body of research now. Um, the, the studies are small, um, but they're consistent across jurisdictions. Uh, we have two uh, US studies, one a felony study, um, one a study of misdemeanors. We have a, a crown study out of the uh, United Kingdom, and we have a very small uh, pilot study out of Nova Scotia. These are the citations, and I'll leave those with you. What is increasingly uh, apparent here is that many of the victims' recants in the criminal system are false. So we need to fix this. So this slide gives you some of case law that uh, reflects this new trend into uh, dealing with victim recant. New trend in the sense that since the KGB decision and after that, Kellawan, 
while the, there's not been major changes, there are two criteria to admit a previously inconsistent statement. One is one of necessity, and the other one is threshold reliability, as you may have learned in your criminal law co course. Uh, ne the law of necessity is not changed a lot, and basically when a victim, ref when a complainant, I should say, refuses to admit her, her previous inconsistent statement, necessity is pretty well made out. However, the concept of threshold reliability has really been expanded uh, significantly, and this is where the, the gathering of information and collateral facts or any admissible evidence becomes key because in the face of recant, if you can find enough collateral admissible evidence, you end up with a situation where even in the absence of a KGB statement, which is a sworn statement, you can still admit this initial statement for the truth of its content. So I've given some of the decision where in essence this analysis uh, has been uh, put forward. There's one even very well written from your Court of Appeals. So uh, for those that are interested in that, extreme, it's a good read. So then let's take our victim recant and think about what, ha what the implications across legal systems. So now she has recanted her testimony under oath in the criminal system. As she moves to the family law and child protection system, she's got a huge problem. And she's in a double bind because now, in order to lead the true evidence that she recanted in the criminal court, um, she has to acknowledge lying under oath. And to make things even more complicated, we've got criminal code provisions that say Anyone who gives evidence um, contrary to prior testimony is guilty of an indictable offense, whether or not the prior or later evidence is true. Um, we've put some of the sections that have impact when you're dealing with a victim recant, and uh, from my own experience, uh, 16 years as a judge, uh, I can honestly say I never saw any prosecution under Section 136 or under Section 137 in, uh, in the context of domestic violence court. And what is interesting is even though the, the research across Canada would tend to indicate that there's uh, very little or no obstruction of justice charges under Section 139.23 for somebody that basically uh, try to compel, in this case, a complainant to change her evidence by either threatening her again or, or dissuading her in some way. Uh, I have to say that my own experience is that in the context of the uh, specialized court, where all the actors are attuned to the dynamics going on behind the scene, I have seen prosecution of, uh, of perpetrators under that section. So it may be not so much with regards to the argument we're making about facts, but it's certainly very interesting in the context of specialized domestic violence courts. And it is one of the reasons why we need specialized courts to ensure where you have all your players, your police, your cr specialized crown, and the judges who actually understand these dynamics so we see more uh, of that action. But what happens in family court? Is the lawyer going to put her on the stand um, in the face of that criminal code provision? What do you suppose happens to uh, full uh, presentation of evidence in the family and child protection case? What, um, so we think about this in terms of professional ethics and so on. So leave that for you to think about. So how do we ensure that information about risk, about danger, is crossed throughout all the system? And this is where we're going to talk about what we're trying to do in, uh, in our own way in, uh, in Moncton. Now first, uh, 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 just a uh, comment. We know from uh, Ontario Death Review reports, we know from the uh, homicide 
uh, domestic violence reviews uh, through, throughout the world. Peter Jaffe's research in Ontario. When parents are in danger, the children are in danger too. Domestic violence is not just between the uh, adults. It has a massive impact on children and uh, the risk indicators uh, in connection with the parents are very similar to the risk indicators of children. So, so we need we need mechanisms um, to share risk information about risk and danger across systems, not only to protect women but also to protect children. Um, I'm not going to go into this in a lot of detail. There are some problems with the uh, risk assessment uh, tools being used in Canada today. Uh, primarily, one of the problems is they're being used uh, limited to uh, adult risk. We don't have validated tools yet um, to assess uh, fully risk to children in these cases. But physical risk is a very, very tiny piece of this puzzle. This, for, from a child point of view, this isn't about broken bones. This is about the effects on children of coercive domestic violence and high levels of stress and conflict between parents in the home. It's about toxic levels of stress. It's about connections between a coercive domestic violence and negative parenting practices. It's about emotional trauma. And it's about what we need to do together to um, help families heal and to promote child resistance. So I think I've, uh, I've tried to put the point across that judges can only make decisions on the basis of uh, evidence as it's presented to them. Therefore, the, the challenge is how to ensure that the Crown, the lawyers, the primary victims, although in the criminal process, by and large, they will be the complainants, but the problem is uh, extremely present in the family court system where very often these complainants are self-represented and uh, how do we ensure that she as well as all the other actors in the system have knowledge and access to risk and danger evidence so that the court can get the full picture. And uh, it, it appears simple and it appears so basic but it's far from being re the reality in a consistent way. We know that working from the top down, the orders have to be consistent. And anybody that works in the court system know that often they're not. And it doesn't need a very big gap for somebody to escape an order that was meant to protect a complainant or her children or, or the children of uh, that complainant. And uh, that's certainly a piece, for, uh, a piece of solution. But working from the top down, I, I see that Linda has put the, the slide with uh, the Honorable uh, Donna Martinson as well as uh, Dr. Margaret Jackson. They've also written in this subject and uh, in addition to being prodded on a regular basis by uh, Linda, we are certainly are inspired by their work as well. So they've done some really important work on judicial communication uh, protocols across systems. But <coughs> the problem doesn't end there, doesn't end with consistent orders. We, uh, if, if uh, the original order is based on um, inadequate evidence, having consistent orders is not going to solve the problem. We need to attend to the information flow behind our court systems. I'm not going to go at length on that, uh, on that slide because I think we have basically discussed it on the, on the necessity of exchanging orders in a consistent and organized manner. 
Yeah, so these are just some cases that enable uh, family courts to obtain and consider evidence from uh, other courts. proceedings. We can establish the death review. Um, the death review research uh, tells us that one of the reasons information falls between the cracks is that the various services have pieces of the puzzle and in many jurisdictions we don't have a mechanism to allow the sharing of information. So one of the things New Brunswick is uh, exploring is creating and is piloting right now is uh, creating community risk management teams which will bring together key players uh, to share information across services. And on that topic, on the, on the topic of death review committees, we have one in New Brunswick. Our court coordinator sits on it, and basically for the purpose of finding where was, where was this lack in the exchange of communication, how much of a contributing factor was it, and try to bring that back to, to us in Moncton and examine our protocol in light of uh, what is, uh, what is, uh, what are the findings of the death review committee? So this is just some of the complexities that we confront as we attempt to work together to um, create information flows uh, between services and among among courts. Um, we can exchange uh, information now in, uh, as you know, when uh, there's imminent risk of bodily harm and uh, this is some of the case law that enables that. Um, we also, uh, one of the things that is very helpful is that uh, Bridge Columbia has done is uh, changing its uh, information, uh, access to information uh, statutes to protect uh, information in domestic violence cases. This is uh, some of the, again, some of the challenges we face. I haven't really gone into the distinctions between risk assessment and danger assessment, but uh, here are some uh, comments about the tools and some of their limitations. But I think uh, Anne, uh, Anne has the, uh, if you look at the slide, the most important is well, the one with regards to uh, collection of facts and evidence. It is, in my view, paramount to the work that we do on a daily basis in the courts of this, pro uh, this country. And one of the cautions from a domestic violence research perspective is as we move forward, we want to be very, very careful that we don't over-rely on so-called validated tools because um, uh, these cases can be uh, novel, unusual, and we need to be able to respond to unusual cases as well. Um, certainly, I am of the firm belief, because otherwise I wouldn't have stayed where I was for 10 years, I'm of the firm belief that unified, specialized VV courts are part of the solution. And when I say court, I, I mean everybody that, I don't mean the judge, the court, prosecutor, or defense counsel, I mean everybody a specialized court should not be just a few individuals. It should be a team of specialists dealing with the issue. So that's extremely uh, important in my view. But you also have to recognize that there are very complicated limitations on what we actually can do because Provincial court is a court of statute. It has no inherent jurisdiction. It has no, the only authority is as it has the authority that's given to it in the, in the legislation or in the criminal code. So that's one thing. We function under one legal regime and the Court of Queen's Bench function on, a, on another. And these are actually jurisdictional, constitutional issue of great complexity and makes it that much harder for to set these flow of information protocol. So our alternative idea is to build a coordinated court project, judge-led, so led by a judge from the provincial court and one of the court of Queen's bench in partnership with, uh, with academic, with, uh, in this case, it's Lynn, Lynn, uh, Dr. Nielsen. And, uh, 
try to set up, having identified all, all the issues, then try to set up a model that will ensure this in a very consistent manner. Uh, we had, you would have been, it would have been interesting if Joanne Boucher, Boucher had been here today because she is the court coordinator and her work has been so critical to the success of the court that she just received a major award in New Brunswick. Uh, but she's the one right now that our exchange system, she does it all, uh, getting the orders, making sure that our case, I mean, there's something wrong here, I think. Huh? I can't see, oh, there it is. Okay, I got it. Okay. She, uh, she will take our docket, uh, the, our court uh, list for the day. She will compare, she will go check if any of these persons are known to the family court system. She will contact child protection. It will all be done, but it's only done flowing one way, i.e. from child protection and um, family court to us. Right now, there's no system to make it flow the other way, and that is a major problem. Uh, the other thing is, it's all dependent on her. So the yeah. day that she's sick, she's on holiday, may get done far from certain that it will be. So this is why we're trying to improve, not just, because, not certainly not because she does, she's not doing the work, she's amazing, but because it needs to be consistent and better informed, informed of what the others are doing, informed about what the others have, and they can be informed about what we do as well. The next slide is basically uh, our, our flow of information as it exists now at the Brunton Provincial Court, uh, GV Court. And uh, as I say, at this point in time, it's only flowing one way as opposed to but this gives you an idea of the complexity of uh, information flow uh, the court coordinator handles into the criminal court. So we want to expand on, on her work. This is just a uh, brief slide on um, uh, you know, our overview of our plan. Uh, we want to bring everybody together in a facilitated way. Um, we want to um, uh, take a peek. Uh, Pre-test, which means trace uh, how information is flowing now, and then post-test after we bring everybody together to improve the situation. Basically, this is how the project kind of looks like at this point. That's what we hope to do, and I'm not going to detail it uh, more than that, but uh, this is what the task we've set for ourselves. Um, and the next series of slides, I don't think we'll go into um, a, a lot of detail here uh, because we'll leave the slides with the, the, the college and, and you can have a look at it. But uh, these are some of the uh, challenges we face as we think about uh, information flow across the systems. Um, and it's not as uh, simple uh, as it sounds, I mean, even identifying uh, domestic violence cases um, across systems, what does it mean to be involved in another system? There again, those are some of the obstacles that we, uh, that we encounter or that we, will, we have to deal with. Uh, one of the ones that I want to deal with is the one, it's the, the one that states that legal systems are not flagging cases by inter, in, by intimate partner violence by IPV. In New Brunswick, and I know in other provinces because I've seen the record of conviction coming from other provinces in the course of my work, there are, there are pro jurisdictions where in fact the criminal record will indicate DV. Um, it's, uh, it is in Moncton, but it, the, 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 because we have a special escort, but believe it or not, it's not in the rest of the province. It makes no sense, but it should be because we're all functioning with the same definition of what is intimate partner violence. And certainly in the family court system, it is not flagged at all. So, 
So that means that from the criminal court, the court coordinator actually has to do this sort of manually by name. Um, uh, so one of our challenges even is how to identify the domestic violence cases across the systems. So oh, this is what we're trying to do. <laughs> Bill, they, well, keep in mind uh, we're limited drawing, well, Linda's limited drawing skill because she prepared the slide. <laughs> so we're trying to build a model that will look all across all service sectors and see how this can flow up into the court and then be exchanged. That encapsulates and, what we're trying to do. And part of the challenge of doing that is how do you, how do you um, create a uh, smooth flow of information while also uh, ensuring that um, the exchange of information doesn't actually increase risks. So that's one of the challenges here as well. Um, as we think about this, um, I've sort of come to the conclusion over, over the years and, and um, that the only way to do this is jurisdiction by jurisdiction, by court jurisdiction by court jurisdiction. Our, our systems all work differently. We need to um, actually tackle this um, by uh, people, bringing people together and actually working together jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Thank you very much. <laughs>